Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. This episode, we have a conversation between myself, Joe Stewart, and Louise Torb. Louise is a Melbourne based Pilates teacher and teacher trainer. Louise is an inspired, passionate, and innovative instructor. Her enthusiasm for her work is infectious and backed by a deep well of knowledge of biomechanics, anatomy, and movement. We also learn about her background in dance and how she discovered Pilates. We'll also learn about her innovative approach in customizing movements to suit specific needs and how she works to bring out the best in her teacher trainees. Louise also relates her background in studying film and how she uses her YouTube channel as both a professional and creative outlet. There's a lot of great stuff in this conversation, so let's get started. Stick around for our picks of the week, and I'll catch you on the other end. Thanks so much for joining us, Louise. Uh, perhaps we could start by um, t- you telling us about your background and where you grew up. Okay, so I grew up in Queensland in a very tiny mining town in Mount Morgan. And then I moved to Rockhampton when I was a teenager with my parents. And then when I was about 17, I moved to Brisbane to study fine arts. And then I kind of dropped out of that after six months. And then I studied dance from there. So it's kind of like, yeah, the beginnings of stuff, (laughs) I guess. And Um, yeah. So so were you dancing in the tiny mining town? When did you discover dance? I did dance classes in the tiny mining town. There was this like a dance teacher who would drive down from Rockhampton and teach, you know, dance classes on a Saturday. And I loved it. I had tap shoes. I'd wear my little tap shoes tapping around. And I had the Nina Barbie ballerina doll. (laughs) And it was just like, so I guess that was kind of like the beginning of, you know, my passion for the body and movement and dance. And yeah make little dance routines with the kids in the playground and no. <laughs> everyone would copy. Always a teacher from an early <laughs> That's age. Right. That's right. <laughs> so it was really fun. And so. so what were your experiences like studying dance? Because I hear that can be quite intense. Uh, yeah, I guess I think dance teachers are different now to what we had. Like, it was just at the time where dance teachers were stopping smoking when they were teaching dance classes. <laughs> so there were even some dance teachers who'd be smoking and then they'd reach down to adjust your foot and there'd be a cigarette kind of oh, up there. Oh, that's like, dropping your fine sprinkling of ash on you. <laughs> yeah, and I think dance teachers were really kind of wanted that kind of like really thin, streamlined look. So they were quite, you know... The dance teachers would say stuff back then, which I don't think they'd be allowed to say to now. Like there were lots of girls who ended up getting breast reductions because they felt so bad (gasps) about being bigger and lots of eating disorders. And I really think I was so privileged to have my dance training because it's given me so much discipline and technique and understanding of my own body and just a love and passion for movement and creativity. But I think the downside to the training that I had, I think it was very, very good training, was everyone was so paranoid about their body and body image. There were mirrors everywhere. There was one girl in the class who was really anorexic and then there were like three other people who were bulimic and there were only 12 in the course anyway. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. Like... yeah. So... so there was no looking after your internal mental health. It was all about how you looked. Yeah, it was very much so, yeah, how you looked. And you think just firstly like health and happiness but even sustainability and longevity as a performer like to not take care of your body and nourish yourself exactly because a lot of the students who were studying like we were all so young we were like you know 18 19 you know some people would have been 17 and a lot of the girls were smoking cigarettes and just to stay thin to stay thin because their teachers modeled it yeah yeah, so, although when I was there, I think most of the teachers had stopped smoking, but, like, because they didn't smoke around us, even if they were. Yeah, yeah. But it was kind of like, it was bizarre. It was kind of like, that was the thing, you'd smoke a cigarette to stay thin, but then, like, they'd be coughing and hacking, and it smells oh, so disgusting. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of like, it's quite an ugly kind of side 
to dance, I think, because dance is so beautiful and pristine. Like on the stage, it's and so you're just like beautiful. a fairy kind of thing floating around, but then, you know, this horrible kind like of stench. Inside, you're feeling horrible. Yeah. And, yeah. So it's kind of like, mm, I tried to be really, you know, I tried to be bulimic and aerobics. I just couldn't do it because I loved eating. And I tried smoking, but it just was so disgusting. It just made me sick. But um, I mean, how lucky for you that, like, they didn't I know. Off, like, I know. <laughs> it's kind of like you think kind of, you know, I'm not perfect. I want to be like this, but I'm not going to be like that. And so, yeah, and you just don't realize how lucky you are at the time with the body that you actually do have. So I think I was actually really, I think I was quite a good dancer. But at the time, like, you're just not sure. Like, you just don't know. <laughs> it doesn't like there was a lot of reassurance. No. Or, you know, building up your sense of self-worth. It would yeah. just be all about pushing you to be more perfect. To be so, better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, I had one of my dance teachers say to me when I um, – she said, oh, if I couldn't get my leg up higher than, you know, 90 degrees, I'd be in tears. Louise, you should be going home crying on your pillow every oh. night because you're not flexible enough. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was like – <laughs> I'll go home and cry tonight. I'll go home and cry tonight. <laughs> so yeah, so lots of things like that, which I think now we embrace more different. We do different body types for dance, especially contemporary dance, which is where I wanted to go as well. So I see this actually in your teaching now because I've been your student and done teacher training with you. How much you do emphasize people feeling good about what's unique about them, and even yeah. if people are coming to you for a weight loss reason, you kind of um, really encourage them to feel good in the body that they have now and to kind of focus on feeling strong and feeling balanced. Exactly, because you've got to start from where you are now. You can't start from where you want to be, like in six months' time or a year. Like You have to be in the body that you have right now. And lots of kind of those types of weight issues, there can quite often be so much going on in that person's life that they're only just coping, like, with what's Absolutely. happening. Absolutely. So it's you... kind of like, if you start to kind of, like, you know, needle down on them and say, oh, your BMI is really high, then that can be really crushing for people. Absolutely. And then they can't yeah. kind of lift themselves out of it. So, yeah. yeah. And when you don't feel good about yourself, you don't make good choices for yourself. Like, when someone is, like, also learning to love themselves in your class, yeah. even if you don't put it like that, it flows yeah. into like healthier eating choices and like and they feel better about themselves yeah and yeah. i really love that about pilates it can be so nurturing because people can do a lot of the exercises and if you have like really bad body confidence but then you can do the standing leg press on the wonder chair and you can do it without holding on that can act- actually make you feel so good about yourself like it, you just gain a little bit more confidence more body awareness and self-esteem. So it's kind of like, you know, it's one way people can start to feel better and find that connection back into their body. Yeah, and if you are an overweight person, it does rule out some types of exercise. Like if you are not strong enough to, say, put all of your weight on one leg, and I've had clients like this. Yeah. And like one client in particular was a dancer and it was just breaking her heart that she couldn't do bar work because her knees and her ankles couldn't take it. But then she could do everything lying down on the reformer. She could do all of those beautiful ballet leg movements and footwork. It's so empowering. Yeah, like afterwards she like hugged me and she was almost crying just to be like, it feels so good to be able to like move in this way again and to feel like how she would be able to progress to like, yes, I'll be able to do this standing one day. Yeah, so, it's so rewarding. Yeah, That's what I really yeah. love about being a Pilates teacher as well because you can really see people improving and getting stronger and seeing them grow and develop. It's like, oh, my God, I've opened that little door or that window for them. And yes, <laughs> yes, you can, like, connect with that joy of movement. Yeah. Like, through injury or, you know, as rehabilitation. Like, it's so powerful. Yeah, I love it. It's also just the feeling of moving on the reformer because it is such a graceful flowing movement it's really nice to be able to connect with that even if you know say someone's struggling with balance or struggling with coordination on the floor like it's so accessible to find that flow and I just love how the reformer moves because as a dancer if you're just doing the mat like the mat work is great but it doesn't feel like you're moving as much but because the carriage slides you really feel like you're actually moving a lot more so you kind of have that feeling of motion so much more so it does feel like you're kind of dancing in a way yeah 
Actually, maybe what we should do for people who are listening who maybe don't know about the different types of Pilates equipment, do you want to quickly run us through what the different parts, types of equipment oh, are? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So probably the workhorse in most Pilates studios would be the Pilates reformer, and which Jo has her in here in her studio, which is it's one of my favourite pieces, but my absolute favourite is the Cadillac. The, going back to the reformer, though, it works on a sliding carriage and it's spring-loaded, so you're working against the tension of the springs which I really love that kind of stretchy elastic feeling as you're working and you can work in on all different planes on the reformer and it has a box that you can put on so it can change like the level that you're working as well the next piece is the Cadillac and both the Cadillac and the reformer were kind of designed after the hospital beds that Joseph Pilates when he was interned during the war at a sport at a um, not a sports camp <laughs> <laughs> At, as a as a kind of like a prisoner of war camp, he a lot of the other interns there had injuries, so he actually gave them exercises on their hospital beds, and he'd take the springs from underneath the bed, and they'd work with the springs. So the Cadillac was designed after that, and also the Reformer because of the use of the springs on when you're lying down on a bed, and then he just developed all this other creative material from that because he ended up working with dancers and gym, gymnasts, so it kind of really expanded all of his repertoire as well from the people who he was working with. And then the next is the Wonder Chair, which is a great dynamic piece because it's probably the most challenging piece. It doesn't take up much space. And it was probably one of the first pieces of home exercise equipment because people used to take their Wonder Chair to their holiday house and work out (laughs) at their holiday house in the summer. They'd have their Wonder Chair and they'd do their footwork and their standing leg press and their back extensions. And that is basically, there's a little video clip of Joseph and you see him sitting on a chair in an armchair and there's his wife, Clara, and he's actually smoking a cigarette or a cigar (laughs) or something. Anyway, then he flips the chair over and then it becomes like the, the Wonder under chair where he's doing like you know presses with it and he's doing all he's got springs underneath yeah springs a bit you push down yeah Yeah. and he's doing all this stuff he's showing it off in front of clara and she's just kind of standing there (laughs) (laughs) and it's kind of it's really cute because she obviously really adored him and he was just like such a showman like he was yeah (laughs) yeah and then the other pieces he created so many pieces there's the ladder barrel it's also called the high barrel which is kind of like an arc and it's designed after a beer barrel. He was a big drinker, Joseph, so <laughs> <laughs> rehashed a beer barrel. And it has a ladder against it. So you can use that to do lots of abdominals and ballet stretches and back extension work and upside down positions. So that's another really, really fun piece. It's the probably the most static piece of equipment. Yeah, no springs on the ladder. Yeah, no springs. You can adjust the distance of the barrel to the ladder for different exercises and but it is I really love it for particular stretches like some of the spine stretches you can do on it feel amazing probably a little bit like the oeuvre in a way and then there's the spine corrector which is kind of it's almost like an oeuvre it kind of has a bigger hump and then a smaller hump and then also the baby arc which is so you can do lots of exercises that you might do with the foam roller on those ones as well and they're probably safer in a way because you're kind of down lower to the floor. You so if you want to yeah. you're not going too far. <laughs> but he even created like little breathing machines as well where you could blow like this little thing and it would test how strong your breath was. You'd had to blow, blow, blow. And finger exercises for finger springs and then like the toe gizmo which straps over your toes and the foot corrector to lift the arch of your foot which is kind of it almost looks like you know those old-fashioned things to measure the size of your foot it kind of looks like yeah like a shoe measuring yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) so he just was so creative Mm. with what he devised and he even made this bed which he tried to market to the the bed making companies and it was a v-bed and apparently it was the best sleep you'd ever get. And he made all this marketing material. It's going to be so good for your spine. Like it'll help with your posture. You'll get the best night's sleep ever. And so he sent all of this information to the bed making companies. And they were like, oh, we don't like your design. It's going to be too expensive to make. But we like all your words. We'll just use those words. And with our other bed. <laughs> yeah, with our other bed. So then they started. So, and they're even the same words that we hear today. Like, you know, silly posture Peter going, oh, you'll get the best night's sleep ever. It'll be so good for your back. It'll be so good for your posture. So it's kind of like, I think he was a little bit jaded Mm -hmm. with that, like having his ideas and concepts stolen but marketed on a totally different thing that wasn't his 
design and there's some cute little videos as well on YouTube and Facebook that you can find where he's on his V-bed demonstrating how you can sleep or not. You get up and you do your sit-ups. <laughs> <laughs> And there's also a very cute video on your YouTube channel about the history of Pilates oh, yeah. that I'll link to in the show notes, Yeah, which is really adorable. It's a really cute one. <laughs> so, yeah, I love that little clip. It's kind of like gone like here, there and everywhere. Like people have said, oh, can I use this in my conference? And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, yeah. So interestingly with the whole history of Pilates and like his words and his inventions, he never trademarked or painted at any of them, right? Like he yeah. invented them and then just sent them out yeah, I into the world. Think, I think there was some big thing to tr- he tried to or someone else tried to patent it and it just never we- never really happened. So it's kind of like... It's, I think yoga's not painted it either. It's kind no, of like yoga common... is thousands of years old. Yeah. So, you know, kind yeah. of came from the age before patents. And there is plenty of controversy about people like Bikram who try and patent their own sequence oh. from within the tradition of yoga. Oh, wow. And so are they able to do that or they can't? He's licensed it. So you have to do his official teacher training oh. if you want to teach his sequence. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm sure people probably just teach it anyway. Yeah, if you call it yoga. <laughs> if you find it, you just yeah, teach it. But, um, yeah, it's really interesting. So, And there's such a diversity of schools out there and different teachers and people who believe in different things with what it should be. There are th- the traditionalist Pilates schools where it's like, oh, it has to be like this, very classical, la, la, la. But it's kind of like Joseph was always evolving his exercises he was always changing his repertoire and it changed with the people who he came into contact with. Which makes total sense. Yeah, like if you're going to be training dancers, you're not going to be giving them the same routine as you give the boxes mm-hmm. because it's just probably not going to gel that well. Yeah, or even if you're training one dance with flat feet and one dance with a really high arch, yeah. they all need different foot exercises exactly. to work towards balance. Exactly. So his repertoire really, I think, developed and expanded with his clients and I think that's that's how it should be like the more we understand the body the more we should be going forward with that and being highly creative because he was such a creative person and if you could see how where his technique is now he'd just be amazed you'd be like oh my god like so (laughs) yeah I guess that leads into another question to be able to create new movements it kind of has to come from a pretty in-depth understanding of how the body works so that yeah. you know what you're actually doing and you know yeah. like safe ranges of movement and what's going to be productive and kind yeah. of what you're targeting. Like, exactly. How did you know that you were ready to start creating or did you just have ideas? I think you sort of start creating because of necessity. Like people come to you and they'll have... For example, they need to strengthen their glute stabilizers. They really need to strengthen glute medius. But then they're in a side-lying position and you're getting them to do some clams lying sideways, but they get a shooting pain down the outside of the lower leg. And it's kind of like, oh, well, that's not going to be helpful because that's obviously a pain. Yeah, yeah, that's not the answer. Yeah. Yeah. But then if you get them in a standing position because of the position of the pelvis and the stability of of everything in that standing position, you can get them to do the same exercise without that referral of pain. So it's kind of like from necessity, you have to change or modify the moves, whether that's trying them out on different planes and different positions. So another example, like with people who have hip issues, like anterior hip pain, or who are about to go into have a hip replacement, to have them lying down, almost in any position lying down, feels very uncomfortable. So you kind of have to work them in four-point kneeling positions or standing positions and no hip flexion. So it's all is focused on hip extension. So it's kind of like you have to modify what you might be doing. You have to think about different ways of how you'd move the body to get the same muscles working but on a different plane. Yeah, so. yeah. It's like putting together a puzzle. So yeah. Like, okay, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. Yeah. But if I put them on this angle and maybe put a theraband on yeah. it, then they can like exactly. get what I'm looking exactly. for. Exactly. And I think Pilates does draw creative people into it. And once you understand body mechanics, then it becomes easier to try and find those solutions, those creative solutions for your different clients. But sometimes you just want to have something a bit more fun. Yes, because it's kind of like oh, I've done this 
exercise for so long now. We've done that standing arm springs in all the different ways. How else can we make it more fun? You go, okay, now we're going to do standing on one leg or going up onto demi point when you're pulling. So it's kind of gives them a different focus or even focusing on the pelvic floor so that they have a different thing going on in their mind. So it kind of keeps both the client and the teacher stimulated within that. You're not getting bored, especially when people come years and years and years. Like, you know, and as they years. grow in strength, like they're not even going to get the same benefit from that basic move if yeah. it's effortless. Like yeah. they so need you, more challenge yeah. to keep strengthening so those muscles. So you have muscles. to change it. But it's amazing how by just changing one element, it can really change how the exercise feels and where how they feel about their body. And like, you know, suddenly they're kind of reignited into, oh, yeah, I'm going to get this one right. And... Yeah, it's really cool. It's like, like you oh. want to be working at the edge of like where you're challenging someone, but where they're still able to like have really good form and good alignment yeah. and not feel like the exercise is too much for yeah. them. Like, yeah, just exactly. kind of at the end of their range of what yeah, they can do. Exactly. So finding that point where it's challenging, but it's not going to be so hard that they can't do it and they lose all kind of faith in themselves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or hurt themselves. Hurt themselves. <laughs> or if they're doing exercise and their shoulders are up the whole time, you think, oh, oh maybe this we'll, look we'll go long, longer, lighter springs and their shoulders can be down. So, yeah, making sure they have that nice form as well. And so this probably taps into part of your brain that you developed as a dancer and as yeah. a choreographer. Would you like to kind of talk a little bit about your evolution through movement from dance to choreography to teaching in a studio to teaching teachers and like yeah oh it's so interesting one thing I really love about Pilates is when I have three people in the space and how I can organize that space and the sequence of exercises and the people and the different bodies and what routine they're going to have to strengthen their particular body types and how that's all going to work so I love that that challenge is part of my brain because I think oh as we get older sometimes it's easy not to use much of your brain and you forget to work it but I love it because it stimulates that part of my brain. But going back to the beginning, when I first started teaching Pilates, it was because a girlfriend of mine phoned up and said, oh, can you cover a Pilates class for me? And I was like, oh, I've never taught Pilates. I've never even done a Pilates certification. She's like, oh, no, it's easy. You'll get a really strong core. So I just went to the bookshop and I got a book and I started looking at the exercises and I was almost reading out of the book while I was teaching her class because this was so long ago before anyone even needed to have insurance, basically. Yeah, yeah, they just needed a teacher. (laughs) They just needed a teacher. So, but then I very quickly, after I realized how much I enjoyed it, because it was like I was performing and I was actually, my audience was there. They were so close and I could see how much they were benefiting from the exercises. Like there were some guys with really tight shoulders. We did some stretches and the feeling that I got was so much better than like the applause that I'd get from doing a dance show because I felt I was actually really helping people. It was tangible. You could see it on their faces. You could see it in their bodies. And people tell you afterwards as well. And it's like you're this miracle worker and you've just given them like a class. And it's kind of like, it's so much fun and it's so rewarding. I just love it so much. So I guess having that kind of excitement starting off, and that was a point in my dance career as well, where... I was doing a lot of rehearsals that were unpaid for. Like I'd have these gigs that would be overseas, but you'd only be paid for the portion where you were overseas. And I was getting injured a lot more. And I found with Pilates, my body stayed really strong. So I was able to keep my knee. My knee joints were probably the worst. They were just falling apart, probably from years of dancing. (laughs) Just, years of teachers just pushing into positions that your body didn't want to go into trying to turn my legs out and probably not using my external rotators and who knows anyway that I just found it was so healing and I felt like my knees got my knee joints became better my legs became stronger I actually became more flexible from working with my legs in straps on the reformer and I was like oh I wish I discovered this years ago at the beginning of my dance career I would have been able to get my leg up even higher yeah <laughs> like, yeah I think so. sometimes it's a surprise but the best way to get more flexible in an area is to strengthen that area it's like once yeah. those muscles are stronger then yeah you know. and they can hold you in yeah. those positions yeah so it's bizarre but I also think because of that eccentric work with the legs in the straps on the reformer where you're really lengthening the muscles under tension that it just creates a much more elastic muscle structure and then you get more length as well because you're kind of putting those muscles against 
attention, but they're lengthening. And it's kind yeah, of like... Yeah, you can work on strength and flexibility at the same time, yeah, the same move. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I just love it. So it's not just like doing a stretch. It's more muscles are involved within that. I guess like in a yoga pose, you quite often have to use the muscles to hold you in that position. You're not just going to flop into a position because that's not going to help to hold anything. So you get stronger that way too. Yeah, but the interesting thing about Pilates is often you get a lot more feedback because in yoga, so you might still be lifting your leg up in the air, but when you have a spring attached to your leg, like you can feel if that leg is shaking on the way yeah. or you can feel the part of that rotation where you lose stability and you have that little bit more support. So yeah. you can slow down through there or kind of work your yeah. core a bit more. So, that's so you do true. get a lot more feedback. Yeah, that's so true. Well, we've started in this a little bit because I teach yoga and Pilates. The main question people ask me is, what are the differences between the two movement styles? Yeah. What's your take on that? Well, Joseph Pilates actually did study yoga and I think he stole a lot of the yoga positions. A lot of them are pretty familiar. <laughs> they yes. look like, you know, like when you see the plank and the cobra, he's just put them on the reformer basically and on the Cadillac and on the chair. But I think with what he wanted to do was to have them moving. So you were, you know, hinging at the shoulders in a plank or in the up dog, you're hinging at the hip joint. So you're moving through the stretch rather than having it as a static pose with the tension of the springs pulling you in or you pulling against the tension of the springs yeah or depending on the mood yeah Yeah, depending on what you're doing so yeah yeah, so I guess it's more like a dynamic yoga it's more dynamic stretching I think the breathing's different from yoga I did a yoga class actually on holidays like in well a little while ago now in October was it October and I really loved the yoga class it was so good it was so strong but I really really loved it because I felt like it was touching base with muscles that I don't normally use in Pilates and I'm sure if a yoga person came into Pilates they'd be going oh hang on I haven't used these muscles yeah they balance each other so so well yeah Yeah. exactly exactly I think yoga might go into more extreme range of movement than Pilates I think we kind of stay in more of a safe range in a way especially in the shoulders so yeah and so much more of a focus on stabilizing shoulders less yeah flexibility yeah less scapular I mean we do have scapular mobility but it's not kind of to that in range of really stretching it out and yeah like with my hypermobile clients if they're coming to pilates with me sometimes i have to pull them back out of their end range because they already have like such mobile joints and it's kind of like oh my god it just looks like your shoulder's so mobile it's just going to pop out of the joint and yeah yeah (laughs) you probably need to work on flexibility today let's work on some of the stabilizers Yeah, yeah we'll do strength and stability work which i really enjoy doing too because you can get some great strong work there and you can make these really hypermobile bodies so much more stable and yeah that's really rewarding to see those changes too yeah and it means as well that those people who do have that big range like they can do that safely like, yeah. it doesn't mean they don't have to hold themselves back. It's just, like, building their strength at the end range of their flexibility. Yeah. And then they've got – so it's so much more productive. Yeah, exactly. So they're not going to, like, strain any joints or ligaments because they'll have that yeah. strength and not be in pain in that area. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. The other thing that I find, like, when I'm teaching yoga and Pilates is – The main difference for me is Pilates is kind of purely physical and you can still get into that meditation state of mind just being really present and really focused on the movement and the breath, whereas yoga has the whole philosophical, spiritual dimension as well. Yeah, which is what I really love about yoga, just the fact that you're made to just really focus on your breath and to relax. Quite often in a Pilates class, especially in a studio where I'm quite often my clients are talking to each other they become mates and it's just like oh this conversation's going on they want to know about the cat (laughs) (laughs) you know what else is going on in my life but then when I do have some clients where I can like some clients just want to chat and it's like oh I just want you to exercise but if you can get them to focus on their breath and to focus on different parts of their body it can be really meditative like you know when you go into a meditation and you're you know you're focusing on your toes or you're focusing on your ankle or your knee or thinking of relaxing different parts of your body i try to incorporate that into pilates as well because we are so stressed in this day and age it's like everyone is has a million things to do and i am so grateful that people want to spend time at my studio out of their busy busy schedule i'm like oh my god i'm so privileged that you're coming here and spending this time with me and it's kind of like i want to get the best 
for them out of their body so that they're not feeling all that tension in their neck so they can actually relax and they can breathe properly like so many people aren't even breathing properly and if we actually do breathe it's you become so much more relaxed you can cope with so much more stress it doesn't have the same thing that yoga has but hopefully we can try to incorporate it into some of our sessions well i think as well sometimes you'll still get to that stage and because i actually love how in your studio people can chat and it's quite friendly and it's kind of got this relaxed vibe where you know people don't just feel like they've got to go be in there and be really super serious yeah but like you kind of lead into the class like that but once you're given like that person over there a challenging little balance thing and this yeah. person's working on something on the reformer like it just naturally kind of quietens down as people come into yeah. their own space and they do become much more focused which i really love and then you can get them to really focus on muscles so you know you can say focus on feeling the backs of your legs working as you're stretching out your knees so although those quads are working think of the back of the thigh and then They have to focus on that so Mm -hmm. they can't let all this other drama and crap in their life come into the studio because they're focusing on feeling their body. And it's really interesting because some of my clients, their body awareness is not that amazing. So they can't kind of, if you go, oh, well, can you feel that you're swaying from side to side? No, no, I can't feel that. (laughs) So it's kind of like bringing them back into their body so they just focus on that so that they can start to feel and reconnect with their body. So even if you feel like you're starting at the beginning each time, I I can see progression. So Yeah, and definitely. And with those clients, to have that focused time to work on body awareness, even if that's not something that you talk about, it's so powerful when they go back out into the world and they can, like, walk down the street without worrying about tripping over or, like, get up and down from a chair without discomfort and pain yeah, like it's exactly so, it's such a powerful difference in people's lives to just be more at home in their bodies exactly and especially a lot of my older clients like I really try and focus on on balance as as what you're saying because there's a real fear of falling over as you get older and especially bone density starts to go down from the age of 50 for women once we go through menopause your bone density starts to go down and the bones actually on a scan can start to become even more transparent so they'll look black as opposed to white on the scan they'll look like dark patches because the density is disappearing so it's really quite terrifying but if you can strengthen people in their balance so that they can feel where their body is, more body awareness, then those people become more confident just interacting in the world. So some people can become housebound because they're terrified of falling over. Yeah, yeah. So being able to get out and, yeah. Have one little fall and then stop exercising because they're worried about having a bigger fall because they haven't really rebuilt their strength after that smaller one. Yeah, exactly. Another question that I get all the time in Pilates, and I'd love to hear how you explain it, is firstly how you explain the Pilates breathing and then also flowing into how you define the core. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a really interesting one. So I guess for me, the Pilates breath, it's a lateral breath. So you can think of, if you have the hands on the ribs, of expanding sideways into the ribs. So you're getting that feeling of opening up almost like a vacuum and then exhaling all the air and it's also it's probably more important to focus on the exhale by getting rid of all the air out of the lungs because then you'll get the natural inhale sometimes if we focus on the inhale then the shoulders and all the accessory muscles start to work so it really is key i think both yoga and pilates have that focus on the breath which is so important and the core for me the core is pelvic floor and transversus really they're probably the most important aspects of the core so it's not necessarily about doing heaps of sit-ups and sometimes if people have weak pelvic floor doing a sit-up is actually going to be worse for their pelvic floor so finding that internal support of working pelvic floor and drawing the abdominals in so working at a level where people can maintain that position without feeling their abdominals bulge out or their pelvic floor bearing down And an interesting thing for me about the core or working the core or keeping that pelvic floor and transversus active is once people have that internal strength and that internal support, I feel like they become more confident in how they interact with the rest of the world. Maybe it's just a body confidence thing, but I think not only is that if you have internal support with your muscles and your muscles are supporting your internal organs, 
you feel more stable and centered, but you also, I think, have more of an internal strength that's on a different level. So I really feel that those two are actually quite closely connected, like that internal support, which is weird for you, Ron, because you had like stomach surgery, so you had quite a bit of your insides <laughs> taken out. Yep, yep. So how is that for you, like, to gain strength after that type of massive surgery? Well, and we were going to ask you about this too, because Pilates actually helped me heaps post-surgery. We pretty much worked out a program for me over the course of a few weeks, and I don't think I would have been able to do half the stuff I can do now without that sort of really strong base. Yeah, it's so essential to rebuild the muscles. Mm -hmm after surgery because like what sort of surgery did you have were they did they cut through the muscles to get to actually just through the linear elbow so oh. they can actually cut through any muscles oh and okay. i asked the surgeon oh, like, oh which God. muscles are you going to be cutting through so oh. it's actually kind of amazing so just it's a straight scar just straight down the linear elbow wow and part of the diaphragm oh and part of the diaphragm oh my as well. God. <laughs> that really affected ron's breathing and he really had to work to be able to find just, a full breath oh, again wow that's full on yeah, because lots of my clients, when they come back after surgery, it's so important to to get stronger again. And cause sometimes people are quite exhausted as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not just the exhaustion from having this physical thing that you've gone through, but it's so emotional that it's kind of like, oh, my God. And all the fear leading up to a major surgery. and Oh, yeah. it's just terrifying. But people, they get through it. That's what amazes me. I see people who live with incredible pain and they move beyond it they're not complaining about it like you know that it's there but people get better people the body has this incredible capacity to heal itself it's amazing to be a part of that process oh it's so rewarding yeah, yeah just to even help out in a really small way but maybe it's a big way for them like i've had people you know cry because they're like oh this is i feel so good now that i've been able to do this i never thought i'd be able to move like that again and it's, wow well you've got it in your body it was always there so yeah, yeah but um yeah it's incredibly important and also i think doing the preparation for surgery like having that time like you were obviously already very kind of strong before going in did you do any extra kind of preparation for that or was it just like everything was a blur um I, I did do a bit of yoga before I went into surgery but I had um about nine weeks of chemotherapy oh leading up to it. that's so exhausting I, yeah so I didn't couldn't do much yeah yeah I wasn't too bad but I think I think I'd just do some stretches on the floor mostly leading yeah. up to it but yeah so it was mostly afterwards I think I, I sort of um stubbornly decided I wanted to <laughs> get back into it but yeah. the great thing about pilates is you can have a very gentle intro whether that is just breathing and doing the footwork and engaging the abdominals mm -hmm. without necessarily doing big loaded movements where mm -hmm. you feel like oh i'm gonna pull my scar mm, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's so much you can do on the reformer lying flat yeah and totally supported and mm -hmm. still really rebuilding that yeah strength. exactly and it feels totally safe while you're doing it yeah, yeah. which is so reassuring as well yeah because yeah. it's quite i think it's quite a big thing to come back to exercise after having such a big surgery but the body it heals itself yeah. I think as well, it is challenging because um, I experienced this with Ron because I had a lot of questions and the surgeons are very vague. Like mm. they'll just say things like, oh yeah, just walk or just do gentle exercise. One surgeon suggested, oh, you could start jogging. And it's like, really? Jogging? No. Like, that seems like a terrible idea. Oh my God. No way. I don't even jog now. Yeah. I just find that that's not good for my pelvic floor, for like my knees, for my neck, for my spine. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It's just like, mm, or my feet. It's just like, ugh. So, yeah. It does seem like it's a, like, people who seem to have had like knee reconstruction type surgeries and more orthopedic surgeries there seems to be a really good rehab progression for them like it's part of their treatment but it, it seems to be a lot less common for people who've had abdominal surgery or another client of mine has just had prostate surgery and yeah. his surgeon was equally vague as to what you can and can't do and it's like this is the center of your body like exactly. this is such an important area to rebuild exactly and it's interesting with prostate surgery because you have to start working the pelvic floor but you have to start very gently like you can't overdo it at the start because it can actually 
Yeah, that's do what the surgery damage. was. Yeah, do more yeah. damage than good. So you've got to kind of like really slowly get back into it, and before you're starting to do, you know, a lot of pelvic floor exercises. And then you have to come back very gently to exercise because you don't want to overload the center as well because that can put pressure on the pelvic floor. So it's kind of like, yeah, but Pilates has the capacity to do, to do that. Like whether you're just doing some knee drops and keeping the pelvis really steady and focusing on your breathing so that you're not overloading that central area. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know who Pilates did his yoga training with? No, mm. I don't, but I would be so fascinated. Mm. He trained in a lot of different modalities. Like mm. he worked as a boxer mm. and then he actually trained people in the army and he trained the police at Scotland Yard for a time. So he kind of did a lot of different types of training and mm. he did. He was a gymnast as well. Mm. He mm. loved snow skiing. So he did so many different things. He was like this all-round athlete and he had quite like a, you know, Mr. Universe type of body, like really muscly and really stocky. Always had a shirt off. Yeah, yeah always yeah. had a shirt off. He wore shorts and he's done yeah. off. <laughs> Standing in the snow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like he did such a, a, you know, and you can see the repertoire. Like he has boxing actions in his Pilates repertoire. He has exercises that look like they should be on the gymnast springs so it's all the gymnast rings and also all the dancer ones as well from working with his dancer clients so yeah it's really mm. interesting and i imagine when he did study yoga it wasn't really that common in the west so he must have really sorted out or yeah, yeah. he must have i hadn't even thought about that yeah because i didn't have youtube back then no. you can't just <laughs> pick up someone's moves my next question to you, when you were a dancer and a choreographer, you were referred to as a movement artist, yeah. and that obviously flows into your work today. Yeah. What do you do to stay inspired as a teacher? Oh, well, there's lots of things I do because I need to be inspired in so many different areas of my life to keep me motivated. So I do think I watch a lot of YouTube videos and... There's so many YouTubers out there and sometimes the smaller YouTubers are better than the bigger ones. Like there's this one woman who I'm watching and whose name I can't remember now, which is really bad. She's really inspiring, but she's she's a smaller YouTuber, but she's really interesting and she's very creative. But then there are other YouTubers who I like what they do, but then I want to modify it because I don't necessarily agree with everything but that they say. But that's inspiring as well to have that little like spark of like, oh yeah, I like that exercise, but yeah. I'm going to do it like this. Yeah, or I'm going to modify it for this piece of equipment or I'm going to modify it for this person or yeah, I'm just going to change that range or change the plane that it's on. So that's, that's really interesting as well. In terms of, because I do a lot of social media marketing, and I really love listening to podcasts for that. I find them really inspiring, which was, I was so excited about being asked ah. to do this podcast. I was like, oh my God, I love podcasts. I'm going to be on a podcast. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and that is called Social Media Marketing, and it's kind of like this American guru. And he has all different types of people come in. He interviews everyone, like, and it's you know about Facebook, it's about YouTube, it's Instagram, like LinkedIn. And it kind of talks about how to make things work and what's the hottest thing. And then you kind of get ideas about what other people are doing. You go, oh, yeah, I might try that. That sounds really good. Or I'll just make sure, you know, I'll make sure I'm facing to the window so that the light's really bright on my face so I don't look so dark. And just little things like that can kind of help with that. And I find my business it can get a really, really, like I find it hard being working on my own. Doing yeah, my being own a one-person operation. Yeah, yeah, it's really yeah. hard to stay motivated with that aspect. And I'm lucky because sometimes I get student placements in and then I can set them up to do admin tasks. And because I'm setting them up to do a task, I have to be really structured about what I'm giving them. So it makes me a little bit more organized. And then they can get all of this stuff done that I would be like, oh, it's so boring. But then because they're doing it and then their energy is always so light. I think I really draw off other people's energy as well, because when you have young people come in and they're all like, you know, ready to do that stuff. They're a little bit nervous. They have that nervous yeah. energy. <laughs> and then it just sort of feels like you get a lot more done or you feel like, oh, yeah, I can do this or, you know, I'm going to be a role model for this person, so I'm going to seem like I'm really good at this and know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also, like, do things kind of best practice because yeah. you're like, okay, well, I'm going to teach them to do it properly, which means yeah. I'm going to do it properly. Yeah, instead I'm going to do it properly. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that's really fun. And at the moment I've got a young student in and she's actually 
a media studies student, which I think I emailed you. You did? Like, I'm excited about that. I know. I know. She's only 17 and she's so creative. She's really, really smart. And, and she's so much, she's like about a foot taller than me. So she, <laughs> she probably looks like an adult. But she's a, you know, she's a child. But it's like she's um, doing some stuff, some editing stuff. So I'm showing her stuff and she's going, oh, yeah, that looks really cool. What if we do this? And then she'll do a bit and I'll do a bit. And it's kind of like, it's really fun. Yeah, having that fresh creative, yeah. other set of eyes, different perspective. Yeah, and because she's younger, she just takes in information so much faster in terms of visual editing information. So it's kind of like she'll see things that I'll think, oh, yeah, I can leave that running for a while. She'll go, oh, I should stop here. Let's just make that a bit smaller. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. Let's tighten it up. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Media expert. <later. laughs> but it's actually really, really good because I think we need to have that perspective because, like, you know, me being 47, to have a 17-year-old come in, that's just generations away. Like, I feel yeah. like she's from a different world in a way. And – but that's really, really exciting because – that's her world. It's all about mm. media. And you studied dance film, right? Like a film yeah. goes for two hours and yeah. a YouTube clip goes for five minutes. Yeah, like it's a exactly. different medium. Yeah, it really is. And I guess I really love film as well because it is about the moving image and I love that feeling and how you can kind of change and edit things. And your YouTube channel, it's very beautiful. Oh, like Your thanks, cinematography Joe. is beautiful and it's really creative. Like, have you got any tips for other people who want to start out on YouTube or even people who've been going for a while? Well, there's a couple of different styles. Like, I kind of mix my styles up because I find that that gives a lot of... I think it's nice to have a mixture of different things. So if you decide on to play around with the style, then really work to that style. A lot of YouTubers do the style where they have like images whether it's you know this is how I clean my house and they'll do like a talking head for a little bit and then they'll just have images of what's happening and then they'll do a voiceover over the top Mm -hmm. and I really love that style for Pilates because it means you can have a body moving in space doing the exercises but then you can say now breathe in breathe out over the top and you don't have to record the voice in the moment but if I am recording the voice in the moment what I'll do is I'll have like a wireless mic and that'll go to my laptop and then I'll have the voice on my laptop and I'll save it into GarageBand. So I guess it would be like having a a sound file Mm -hmm. and then you put that sound file. I will then use it in Final Cut Pro and I'll sync up the sound, the good quality sound with my bad quality sound, the actual sound that's being recorded on the camera because the cameras that I have, they're they're good with pictures but not with sound. Like their microphones are a bit crap. So... So then this I'll, way you can have, like, you yeah, can light it up to the right yeah, time. Yeah, you sync it up image. to the right yeah. time. And once you have, like, the sound and the video synced, then it's really an easy process to edit from there. If I'm doing the voice with the actual voice over, or not the voice over, the voice with the picture that's mm-hmm. synced at the same time. So I guess that's another style. Or just doing, like, almost like an ad type of style where it's quite fast and choppy and different angles. So I guess the best advice I would give is if you're doing video, make sure you have really good sound, whether that's recording the sound and syncing it up later or doing a voiceover with proper recording of the voiceover where you can t- take the time of, you know, what am I going to say to this picture? And Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's actually really, really fun because then you can put other things over the top of it make sure you're relaxing your shoulders or breathe or visualize that you're floating in a cloud so you can kind of put more imagery over the top of those ones because you've got a bit more time and space to think about it because you're not just teaching on the spot yeah like your jumping video there's a whole lot of really quick fancy footwork like yeah. if you were trying to just talk through as you were doing that you'd be panting because oh, it's going so fast it would sound terrible yeah it would be so bad yeah. I'd be like, you can tell I'm really an unfit Pilates. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, not only is good sound absolutely essential, which is why it's so good you've got this recording thing here, um, but also having good lighting. And I've noticed, like, my face looks so different. Like, if I if my face is more lit from... I get dark shadows and I look more untrustworthy from listening to my iPods podcast about <laughs> like the lighting. You've got to have light that shines on your face evenly so that you look more trusting and 
honest. And I guess more just like vibrant and yeah, healthy. Yeah, more vibrant and healthy. Yeah. But if you're looking shadowy, yeah, you, then, then you, you look, look shadowy. Then you look a little bit shadowy. So it's yeah. really important to have the light there on your face, especially because we communicate so much with our face. But also just making sure you can see the body as well. So I've noticed if I'm wearing black and I'm doing exercises on a black mat, no one can see what I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So then I might use an orange mat underneath or I'm just too scared to wear like the different coloured leggings. Like, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm not that brave. <laughs> but yeah, like that type of thing I think works really, really well. I think as well with things like that, things like good lighting and good sound – Sometimes you don't even notice that it's good. You only notice when it's bad mm-hmm. and then it's distracting and you don't even want to watch the yeah. rest of the Or you go, video. I can't see what's happening. Yeah, it's just or frustrating. Or what she says. Especially so if someone's watching it on their phone so they don't even have a big screen. So it's got to be really clear. Yeah. Which is why I think I really like Instagram because everything can be so graphic. Like the body can look almost like a graphic animation. It, you know, sometimes it transcends being a body because it's kind of... You know, almost like a silhouette some people look like when they're moving. And I like, you can see exactly what the shape of the exercise is. This is big picture stuff. Social media and YouTube and, you know, inspiration from Mm. online. What do you do day by day? Like, say, before your class or in your morning or at the end of the day? Have you got any little self-care rituals to keep you feeling good? I do love doing stuff where... I make my own scrubs and stuff like that. We like make like a honey and sugar and vanilla body scrub. And then using that scrub your whole body. It just feels so good. And it would smell so good. It smells so delicious. You just want to eat yourself. It's like, ah, it's so yummy. (laughs) And and then it's got oil in it as well. So it feels like it's really moisturizing your skin. And I love to have that type of thing at the start of the day, like using some kind of exfoliation thing. And it's interesting because Joseph Pilates was one of the first people to talk about exfoliation. He was into exfoliation and about, you know, making sure you scrub all around your body because it's good to get your body moving, like, you know, right through your back, the backs of the legs and your back not using a brush but you've got to use you know so that you can actually reach and move your arm right behind your back to scrub the whole body so I do really love that as a ritual to start the day and sometimes I'll finish the day like that as well because I find it so relaxing to kind of have a shower and like be all scrubbed up and moisturized and you go into bed and everything's really I really love doing that type of stuff sometimes I don't get into the studio enough by myself but when I do it just feels so special because it's it's a nice space to be in and it's just really quiet and it's just, I don't know. It's like, this is my time. Yeah. yeah. And it's really nice because then it allows a little bit more space for a creativity as well. So you can kind of think, oh, how would I do this? What does this actually feel like? Would this be good for this person who, you know, I saw this morning or yesterday? Is that going to help them with what they need to strengthen? Something that I noticed that you do a lot in your own studio as well is you reconfigure it a lot. Like you move oh, yeah. things around and rearrange things. So it's always a bit of a new, fresh experience when you come in. And then that yeah. allows for configuring different exercises as well. Yeah, I think I do that because my space is not quite big enough to do everything that I want to do. And then I think, oh, I want to do this arm spring series. Oh, the only way I can do it is if the Cadillac's over here so I've got more length, so I can use the whole length. And then, like, I want the reformer somewhere so I can do something else or the chair has to be there. And Yeah, yeah, so, right. I'm going to be facing the mirror in this direction, yeah. so I'm going to put this thing here. Yeah. yeah, or so that people can see what they're doing with their hips. I'll put the chair right in front of the mirror and then I'll move it over here so I can see, like, on the other side. So, yeah, and I think that does create an energy in the space as well. Like... I really think that I love the the energy that I have in my space and I, I know I've worked on it and I'm trying to do a bit more of a conmary decluttering thing so it feels more open and the energy can flow a lot more too. And I, I think it really helps with my clients as they come through. They feel more space. They're able to breathe more. Mm-hmm. So Definitely. Yeah. I think as well, especially if people – are easily distracted having a lot of visual clutter around is not helpful because there's all these like little cluttery things yeah but even if someone feels constrained in a space you see it in their movements like they don't extend as far yeah. because they're right in the wall or the person next to them so yeah that's really interesting actually because as going back to my dance training when I first traveled overseas over to the UK a lot of the studios there were really small compared to our studios in Australia and they'd have so many dancers crammed into a small space the dancers actually took really really tiny steps they didn't like take the space whereas the Australian dancers would just leap through like <laughs> athletes. Like, 
dance. Wide and, open spaces. Yeah, like, we had, like I felt like the Australian dancers really could leap further and took much bigger steps and really were much broader, spacious dancers. So that was really exciting for me to see because I was like, oh my God, our level of dance is different. But it's, I also think we were better than a lot of the overseas dancers who were kind of supposed to be at the same level. It's kind of like, oh my God, I didn't realize my training was so good. And Yeah, yeah. I guess because you think you're in a bit of a cultural backwater and then you go yeah. into Europe and you're like, oh, actually, we've got our own thing going yeah. on, which is pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you do. You feel like that coming from Australia, that you're not quite there yet. Like <laughs> you're a little bit behind everyone. Something else that I kind of just notice you do... I don't know if it's a way to keep your own teaching fresh or just something that you're drawn to because you do teach so many different populations is Mm. you do quite a few specialized workshops yeah I'm really excited to be going to your Pilates for active aging workshop this weekend do you want to just kind of take us through a little bit about what you'll be focusing on and in that workshop oh there's so many different areas and I was looking over what I wanted to cover I'm like oh my god I hope we have enough time to cover everything in the workshop because there's so much I do Looking at the manual, there is a fair amount on hip replacement. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, because that's kind of – it's such a common surgery these days. And, like, younger and younger. Yeah. I had a client in her 40s. She had a hip replacement. She was, like, 41. She had a new hip. Then she had another new hip, like, a couple of years later. So that's a common surgery. And also, I think, because – because I'm getting older and... We all are getting older. I know, yeah. <laughs> We're all getting older. And my client base is a lot of older people. And I love working with older people because they've got so much life experience and I find them really interesting people. So that's a bigger aspect of my client base. And then I also want to help them through a lot of the changes that happen. From 50, as a woman, your bone density starts to decrease. And it's kind of like if you haven't been consuming enough calcium and getting enough vitamin D and doing enough exercise in your younger years, that's something that is a worry and you really have to work on. And so I guess that's a big one for active aging. And it's the number of people falling over and then that's what puts them in a nursing home from accumulation of falls Mm. it's really scary and it's kind of like it's completely changed your life just one fall or two yes exactly and some of my older clients say oh i'm just one fall away from the end oh "Oh, no what is that it's like what what are you talking about so i think that's yeah that's a big part i'm just exploring different ways and also strengthening muscles But another aspect of aging is we need to keep it interesting and keep changing what the repertoire is, even if the repertoire is has become smaller because we're not doing the jumping and we're not doing the curl ups. Part of the brain needs to still be activated and stimulated. That's how we maintain like mental health. The mental health, yeah. yeah. So making sure that there is a sequence of moves that people are learning so that they're having to remember what that sequence of moves is or just making sure it's different or they're working on a different piece of equipment as soon as they walk into the studio because as you age one thing that goes down is that mental thing and the more you expose your brain to new stimulus whether that's going to a different cafe or trying a different food or doing a different exercise that you haven't done before that makes the brain more alive so the more we can do that the better as well another thing with aging that really slows down is reaction time so i've been doing a little bit lately of like ball catching or you know throwing a ball in the knee and catching it because as we age our reaction time slows as well and you don't want to be driving with an old person in the car like my mum, and she's like a bit slower <laughs> on the brakes although she's always kind of like stop starting on the brake anyway yeah. so, drive. so reaction time is a really important one too so it's kind of now I'm encouraging all my older clients to play with their grandkids with ball catching exercises because it's going to keep their brain young and their movement and reaction time and those neuromuscular pathways firing up and youthful. So they're kind of some of the areas. Balance, reaction time, just getting keeping the brain stimulated and, yeah, keeping the muscles strong, so lots of strengthening. And like weight bearing for bone density. Yeah, weight bearing for bone density. But I also go into some of the different kind of 
things that you might expect with people who have lived a long time. So most people who've, who've like lived a wear long, and tear type. Yeah, injuries. like their joints wear out. They'll have arthritis in their hands. So doing exercises for the hands incorporated into the footwork, for example, making sure that you're not overworked. Like arthritis is a tricky one because you need to get the muscle, the joints lubricated, but not overdo them yeah, so that they can't yeah. walk the next day. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a fine line with keeping that kind of lubrication. Also, if you've lived a long time, the likelihood that you've gone through something like cancer is actually really high. Mm. Like, it's, you know, if we're going to live till we're 120, we'll probably all have like some sort of cancer along the way. And like lots of women have gone through breast cancer. Um, lots of women have had hysterectomies and how to keep those pelvic floor muscles strong when they've lost parts of structures of their internal organs. Um, and also maybe at a time when they weren't given pelvic floor physiotherapy directly after that surgery, they were just sent home yeah. to just do their best. Yeah. And like my mum wasn't given any exercise or told anything about pelvic floor. And then, then she gets, she's had four kids, four natural deliveries and it's just... Uh, it just sounded pretty hideous, some of the deliveries that she went through. And she wasn't really given any help or advice. And then she had a little bit of a prolapse. And she was told surgery was the only answer. And then I was like, no, mum, you've got to exercise. Go back and get a second opinion. So yeah, definitely. And then she was really angry with the person who said, oh, you need to have surgery. When all she needed to do was just to strengthen those pelvic floor muscles. Yeah, and like wow. one surgery could lead to another surgery because they've got to heal after that first one. Exactly. Like, yeah. It's just massive. And other things like shoulder injuries, quite often like some of the ligaments, because they become not as elastic, then they're more likely to just sort of snap. So it's kind of like making sure you're strengthening the shoulder but keeping them in a range that's going to be safe for them but with as much mobility and strength as possible but not irritating the joint in a particular direction or whichever direction feels like it's going to cause pain going in the opposite to that. Yeah. So there's lots of things to really work on and I guess building bone density is really important in terms of getting the muscles to pull on the bones so that the bones start to become dense from that muscular work because that's what's going to create more density in those bones is by the muscles pulling on them well one thing i want to add i really like that it's called pilates for active aging rather than say pilates for seniors or pilates for over 60s or something because a lot of these things that you're talking about they can actually happen to people at any age there's no age limit on when you develop a hip issue or osteoporosis and it's also sometimes there's this perception that people are only going to get worse it's like, yeah. oh, it's just age-related, like, I'm only going to go downhill Yeah, they just go, here. oh, I'm getting old. Yeah, yeah, and I really hate it when doctors tell people that it's just old age because it's like, yep, you'll just get, you'll just feel worse and worse and worse over time and there's nothing you can do when actually there's a lot so that you, much can, you do. can do. So much you can do. In fact, one of my clients, she was diagnosed with Parkinson's and that's one thing that we're going to cover as well. And from that diagnosis, she's really fit now she's super fit it's kind of like Like it's been a turning point it's been a turning point she looks incredible and the exercises she can do are all really she can do them all really well but you can see the progression but because she's keeping her joints mobile because everything starts to stiffen up and your range becomes much smaller also your balance becomes really quite bad but her balance is amazing she's still got all the range she's got the strength there and it's really encouraging to yeah, see. Yeah, like when you've been diagnosed with a degenerative condition, but to feel like you can actually improve your fitness yeah. and your health still within And that. she's like, this is the fittest I've ever been. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really great to see. And some of my clients, their bone density has improved as well. They've had a scan and then like, you know, six months or a year later, they've gone back and their, their density has improved. I was what, wondering how long it took bone density to improve through mm. exercise. So you'll yeah. actually see a difference in six to 12 months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which that's is great. So amazing. Yeah, it's really encouraging. It's like, oh, that's such a relief. So I think they probably would do a test kind of yearly, which is great. Well, another workshop that I notice you offer quite regularly, and I've done, which has yeah. been fantastic, is pre and postnatal Pilates because yeah. there's so much pelvic floor stuff and yeah. postural stuff. Do you want to share a little bit about what you cover for that population? So within that course, we look, there's programs, four weekly programs from 12 weeks, and then there's like 16 weeks so it kind of goes in four weeks 
And it's devised from working with my pregnant clients over a period, of, a long period of time and documenting what exercises I actually did with them. So I knew what to expect during the different stages of the pregnancy. So it's kind of like at 16 weeks, you're not supposed to lie on the back because of the weight of the placenta on the vena cava. So working in sideline positions or four point kneeling positions, things like at about 17, 18 weeks, they can really feel the ligaments stretching. So doing stuff that feels almost like period pain. Mm -hmm. So not doing stuff that's going to make them feel like they're going to have a sore tummy. So maybe a little bit more. Kind of, of those deep stretchy lunges. Yeah, and, stuff yeah. like that. And we do cover things like SIJ dysfunction. So if the pelvis is really unstable. So we look at the different repertoire there. And even with pregnancy, making sure that you're always standing on two feet, never standing on one leg because that can cause problems and imbalances in the pelvis. We also look at osteitis pubis. So inflammation kind of in the groin where if the as the relax and the hormone relaxing of pregnancy becomes stronger the pelvis almost kind of starts to in some women fall apart so strengthening like all of those pelvic stabilizers like that the glute medius especially is so important to keep that pelvis stable and to kind of keep everything together to yeah, alleviate that can, type of pain. If you can't use your abdominal muscles and your pelvic floor muscles as much to stabilize, like you really need your glutes. They're yeah, the ones that are going like, to exactly. stop you getting a sore back and exactly. help you keep your balance when you're walking around. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and balance, like your center of gravity shifts like as the pregnancy grows. So, you know, 30 weeks, people are falling over because their center of gravity has shifted. It's kind of like, oh, have you fallen over yet? Oh, yeah, getting out of the car. Yeah. <laughs> the other yeah. thing I've noticed that you've done with your prenatal client, clients as well when I've been observing in your studio is sometimes it can feel like when you're programming for a pregnant woman you're just taking exercises out no abs work no lying, yeah. on, your belly, no lying on your back so you end up doing a lot of glute work and a lot of arm work yeah but you really emphasize how helpful that is after the birth when you've got this strong upper body yeah. carry your baby and strong posture so it doesn't just feel like you're doing all these arm exercises because you can't do anything else yeah but you're actually emphasizing why they're so helpful exactly and helpful for the future exactly because you want to be able to have strong arms to lift the baby and all the baby's stuff and to be able to breastfeed and everything and now we're covering a little bit on mastitis as well and is there something else i think that's the next new thing that i've got in which is basically just making sure if someone does ha is susceptible to mastitis or they have had it then you make sure you do the pec stretches and you also need to do pec strengthening as ah. well which you kind of wouldn't think oh so you need to kind of like mobilize that whole area and i guess that's going to get all the fluid going as well like help lymphatic drainage through there yeah just by movement so and i guess as well like it, just because your pecs are tight it doesn't actually mean that they're strong so sometimes that strengthening exercise will really warm that muscle up and get lots of yeah. blood flowing there. and then when you move into the stretches yeah like, that will be a that's lot more help. productive Productive. exactly exactly so it's really interesting i love really working with pregnant clients because it's kind of like you feel like you're a part of someone's most amazing part in their life where they're going to have a baby and it's like oh my god this is so exciting and then afterwards people's bodies are so wrecked after having a baby it's just like <laughs> they're coming back to the studio and you're going okay now we just do like oh we'll do gentle knee drops and we'll start really gently but the other amazing thing is people's bodies come back. It takes a long, long time, but, you know, nine months or a year, you feel like their bodies have come back together and they're becoming stronger and stronger again. And they're doing repertoire that they, you know, weren't even doing before they were pregnant. So that can be really empowering to see. Like I've had some clients like that as well, where it's kind of like, you know, 10 years on and they're doing all this advanced repertoire. And you saw them when they were pregnant and then you saw them after the baby and it was like, mm. <laughs> What I notice as well, which is really interesting, is often some people don't exercise or take time for themselves until they get pregnant. And then once they get pregnant, it's almost like, oh, I'm doing this for the baby. It's like they couldn't take that time for themselves. Yeah. But taking care of themselves is so much more of a focus when they are pregnant. And it's like, even if they're working or busy with other kids, they have those couple of hours or one hour a week where it's just their time yeah. and then postnatally it's even more important that they have that hour that's just for them and yeah. they can just breathe and move and it's like not about taking care of someone else it's like looking it's after for them. themselves that is so true and it's it's absolutely essential to schedule that in because if you're a mum like a new mum if you don't have that space oh you could become a lunatic very easily i think <laughs> so it's really important to kind of have 
that piece. And it's kind of, in this day and age, I feel like so many of us, and especially us as women, we often like give up so much of our time for other people. We're always kind of like looking after other people. You probably got looked after very well by Joe when you were. I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. I feel like I'm good at it. I love looking after people. I do get something out of it when I look after people, but you do have to really look after yourself. If like, you're not... It just doesn't work. You don't function as well. Yeah, like so. you don't actually have energy to take care of someone else if you're not taking care yeah, of yourself. Yeah, exactly. And whether that's for me, I just want to make small changes in my life. Like this year, I guess it's kind of like the new year. What are your resolutions? But not really. Like I want to you know, drink less coffee, have more green tea because that's more energizing. I know that my whole system works so much better when I have green tea in the morning rather than coffee, which is kind of like this. <laughs> like, <laughs> and just little things like drinking more water, making sure I'm doing other exercise besides Pilates. Yeah, doing that's... something that you don't teach. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like well, even if it's just going for a walk or, you know, just hanging out with my nieces or nephews and playing on the swings or something that's childlike and fun or going dancing, stuff that really rejuvenates you and takes I think dancing actually I've started doing social dancing oh fantastic and that's actually really good for my mind as well because you have to remember all the steps when you're in the dance class and it's really fun because you're interacting with people but there's kind of no expectations yeah and you don't have to yeah. really have a conversation with anyone like you're socializing but in a way that's physical but it's not which is like really great for me because I love oh, that definitely. type of communication and when and... you've been talking all day and giving other people your focus all day it's so good to have an activity for yourself that is still social like you're getting out of your house where you've also been all day and moving but you know you have your own space within that yeah and it's great as well because I love seeing other teachers style like the dance teachers style and they make it so fun I want to be more like that where it's like a really fun experience where people come in and it's really funny and fun and they're telling jokes and it's a little bit flirty and it's a little bit but it's kind of well, not that you could be flirty in Pilates when you're teaching people Pilates. Lift <laughs> your pelvic floor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's kind of... There are some moves you can still put a bit of swagger into, though. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and I think that kind of really helps to keep me energised as well. When did you decide that you are going to start teaching other teachers? I think when I had a back injury and I was like, holy shit, how can I maintain my studio? I need someone else to help me in the studio. I can't afford to pay anyone. I know I'll get an apprentice. Oh, good call. (laughs) And then I was like, oh, hang on. No, I'll need to have a training course to do that. And that was kind of like the idea that started off. But before I had the injury, I was... A girlfriend of mine asked me to help devise a teacher training course for a mat work at MSAC. Yeah, I designed the manual. (laughs) Yeah, you designed the manual. That's how we met. (laughs) Yeah, so it started back then and it was kind of like I really enjoyed the process of being part of writing the manual and devising the courses and developing the material and it was so rewarding. I just loved it and I also found that my own teaching improved immensely from thinking about how would I teach this to other teachers. So I think that whole process of giving over, being able to teach the Pilates material makes you go into the Pilates repertoire so much more deeply so you understand it on a different level so that you're able to give that to other people. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you'd rediscover exercises that maybe you don't teach as regularly. Yeah. And then you go through like, okay, these are all the benefits. These yeah. are the muscles that I'm working. And you forget about some of the great exercises and great moves. And others you think, oh, man, why would I ever teach that exercises? Like, you know, like if it's a like control balance. And I guess as well when you're going through that process of narrowing down what you're going to put in the manual, it does make you really assess like which what are is the, the exercise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you think, well, if I'm taking out some of the more advanced repertoire that's kind of maybe not going to be great for a a group exercise class in a gym, what other ones can I put in to replace it that are a little bit more modern and contemporary that will actually help people a hell of a lot more than, you know, doing a rollover? Yeah. And I really love doing my training with you, how you really, it's like you see everyone's individualities Mm. and you really kind of bring that out of them when you're training them to be teachers. Yeah. So that side must be really rewarding as well, just seeing people grow and blossom as Absolutely. you're training them. And to see you, Joe, as well. Aww. And to have your studio <laughs> and just knowing how you're going to be renovating as well and making it even more spacious. And how, like, you've just set everything up and doing all your podcasts. It's awesome. And I feel so oh, proud. Thanks. I've had, like, students open up studios and they're just faring so much better than me. And I'm like, oh, my God, I started that little seed. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's just like... 
amazing to be a part of other people's lives and see them really grow and develop. And it's I feel kind of like the best compliment when one of your students wants to become a teacher. So you're like, oh, you know, you must really love it. I and, know, you know. It's so good. It's so inspiring. And it's just, yeah, I really do love it. And also I think Pilates and yoga, like those movement arts, they really, the people who are drawn to that, they're all physical people. They're very in their bodies. And I love interacting with those people who have that kinesthetic knowledge or that kinesthetic craving so it's kind of on the same you're like these are my people yeah (laughs) and it's so good because then you relate to those people and you see people grow and change and it's like oh my god that's amazing so yeah so I've really really loved it and I think it is really important to find your own teaching style because some people don't have the same strengths I've seen some of my students come through and you watch how they teach and their tactile cues are so informed for someone who you wouldn't think, oh, how come, How do they know so much? Like they're a middle-aged woman. Yeah, how can they look at that shoulder and realise that they just need to touch there? Yeah, to, yeah, and then they're able to find the exact position to touch and they get a really good response. And it's kind of like these people have magic hands. Make sure you use that in your class when you're teaching because your hands are so informed with how you touch people. And it's not necessarily a hard touch or a gentle touch, but it's just an informed touch and the timing of the touch. And that can be such a strength as well. So you really have to find within yourself, if you're becoming a teacher, what your strengths are and how you can bring those forward. So if you're someone who's not a skinny blonde, demonstrating like all the advanced exercises, that's not going to be, if you're not that body type and you're not that style, then you shouldn't be going there. It should be what your strengths are. And I think are. that the world has more than enough beautiful people demonstrating kind of unattainable movements. positions. Yeah. I don't think that's inspiring for the average person. I think yeah. it can be quite alienating. Yeah, like, exactly. Because I just, just, you know, just make people feel bad about themselves. I know, exactly, because you can't do it. It's like, oh, why can't I do that? We get enough of that from commercial media without bringing it into our own teaching. Exactly. So I think it's important to have a diversity, but also finding where your strengths are. Like I know for me, in terms of movement, my strengths are more about spine mobility as opposed to doing a high arabesque with my leg like right up in the air because I just cannot look like those girls. I don't look like those skinny girls who have incredible mobile hip joints where they're you know their legs touching their ear I don't have that but my spine is quite flexible and I like that movement through the body it feels really beautiful to me and I'd like to share that and have that as part of you know almost like a signature of you know this is what I my style what I like to do and that so, stuff feels so good because our spines are just stuck in the one position for most of us, like sitting down all day. To be able to like free up and move, yeah. like, that feels amazing. Absolutely. Following on from emphasising what makes people different and emphasising innovation, how do you find the balance with like bringing it back to what actually makes it Pilates and kind of staying true to that yeah. tradition? It's really interesting because I, I did a little live video about I think it was about opening up the shoulder and then there was and then I did like I used the Cadillac to do a pec stretch Mm -hmm. which is kind of like not what the Cadillac's designed to do and this woman said this is not Pilates this should be yeah this is not Pilates I'm so glad I don't live in Australia anymore (gasps) this is total like what did she say it was she wow. said it was really, I'll have to find the exact quote, I'll send it to you, but it was really horrible what she said. And I was, oh my God. And so then I sent it to other people going, what do you think of this? Is this, what, is this like, and then everyone was going, oh no, that was a really good session. I really liked that. It was really interesting. It wasn't necessarily Pilates, <laughs> but, but like it really was a great tutorial on the shoulder and how to strengthen and stretch. Oh, I had to open out the shoulder. I think it was for opening out shoulder girdle. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of people out there who are very, very strict but I know that Pilates himself wasn't he was quite broad and Mm. his repertoire was always expanding Mm -hmm. and if he was still alive today who knows where his repertoire would be it would be massive he was an innovator he was an innovator and he created so many different pieces of equipment and he probably would still be creating those different pieces of equipment Mm -hmm. so Pilates is meant to breathe it's still supposed to have life and if you saw a lot of the original exercises 
they have been modified and changed. Joseph, when he was doing the swan, his neck was in a terrible position. You know, a lot of his shapes we'd be correcting in our studio yeah, because yeah. they're not aligned properly. And we know more about the body now. Like when Pilates began, his goal was to make the spine perfectly straight, right? Yeah, and flat. Now, yeah, like flat. Like now we're working for neutral. And yeah, exactly. Mobility. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I just hope that Pilates continues to to grow and to breathe. I do understand people wanting to keep that classical line of Pilates and maintain the original, you know, Joseph Pilates repertoire. But I think it's so much more expansive than that. And if you just keep coming back to making sure your form and technique is good and that you are using the breath and engaging the correct muscles. But even Joseph never talked about pelvic floor. So it's kind of like yeah, yeah. And to me, that's such a it's integral the part, part of it. Yeah, yeah. It's an integral part it's of the Pilates. foundation of it. Yeah. yeah. When you are bringing in things that aren't traditional, to maybe mention that to kind yeah. of go, this is a classic exercise, and this is a variation where I'm bringing in a bit of this yoga, yeah. or I'm bringing in this different yeah, part exactly. as well. Just so it's kind of clear where what the tradition is. is and where the and where it's gone and away from. Are. Yeah, because some of my favorite exercises, they're not Pilates exercises, like book opening and clamps. They're not original Pilates exercises. Well, they're such classics though. I know. <laughs> they're like, you want to do them in every single class because they're so good. And they're, so, they're exercises where they're just for so many populations. They're so beneficial. They're so accessible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And everyone feels good after doing them. Like you feel stronger. You feel more mobile. So easy to spice it up with a few different variations for the people who are ready for yeah, more. Yeah, exactly. So in my mat work course, I do have lists of, well, these are the classical exercises. These are the modified classical. And these are like not Pilates. <laughs> but they're really good <laughs> they're really good and you've got to use them in your class because they're going to benefit so many people and you need to have like a broad repertoire just to keep it interesting once you've been teaching for like three months you're like okay what else can I do now <laughs> I think it is as well it's actually a criticism a lot of people have of Pilates where they'll be like oh yeah I tried it but I was bored so... yeah and it's that's so not what Pilates is about like Joseph was always mixing it up and changing the breathing. Oh, you're supposed to breathe in here. You're supposed to breathe out there. That depends on who you were because for each of his students, he gave them a different breath pattern. So now it's time for Picks of the Week. And I'll start with a book I'm currently reading. It's called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by Chogyam Trungpa. I hope I pronounced that correctly, who was a Buddhist teacher. And the book is sort of about how we can attach ego to spiritual practices or spiritual beliefs so it might be something like thinking that you're perhaps a little bit more evolved than someone else because you have a regular meditation practice or or attaching ego to even having buddhist statues or something like that and we have many around here and (laughs) and i realize that even talking about this subject makes you think that perhaps you have a little bit of a Someone in the spiritual truly isn't <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So that makes for an interesting read, but yeah, I'm really liking it so far. What's your pick of the week, Louise? Oh, my pick of the week is the butterfly tree. It's a stars Melissa George, and it's just, just this beautiful it didn't really get that many stars, but <laughs> I really loved it because it was such a beautiful story, and I probably relate to it as well in a way, because it's about this aging dancer and how she's going through a change of life and setting up her own business in a small kind of town in Queensland. And your place reminds me because you've got these beautiful colours on the ceiling. So she opens up this florist and the florist is in this glass house and it has all these beautiful colours across it. And the film is so beautiful. It's like the cinematography is amazing, like the lighting. But I also found the story was amazing because she's like this ageing dancer and going through all these different changes and... Yeah, it kind of makes me feel, oh, that's sort of like me in a way. Like, <laughs> And it's kind of a love story as well. She's like, there's a, there's a dad and, and who's a pretty hopeless dad and his little boy who both fall in love. The boy's about 14 or 13 or something. And they both fall in love with her. And the dad, he's lost his wife two years Aww. previously or something. So it's just a very, very sweet story with a lot of drama and like a love triangle in a way, but um, I just loved her story mostly because I think it's kind of like, this is, yeah, I won't tell you the rest of it, but it was, yeah, I loved it. So. And sounds like, like very visually stunning It was well. just beautiful. It was so beautiful. Like, I just loved it. It was just so beautifully filmed. Every image had the light, like just making everything look even more beautiful and flowers. I love flowers. It was just <laughs> like, oh, 
is so beautiful. My pick of the week is the Ouv. And it's kind of like a combination of a small ball and a foam roller. So it's a balancey prop, but when you lie on it, it feels like an amazing back massage. Uh, it was invented by Daniel Vladata. I'm not sure if that's how you say his name. And he was an osteopath and he actually developed it because he felt like he was just fixing the same issues for his clients every time he saw them. And he wanted them to be able to do that for themselves at home. It's probably a prop that's a little bit more suited to someone who already has a lot of yoga or Pilates understanding, uh, unless you're going to do their teacher training, which I do want to do in the future. But it does come with its own app, and there are classes you can do through Pilates anytime. So while I'm really looking forward to doing the training, you don't necessarily have to have done it to get benefits from it, especially if you also love wobbly, balancey, massagey things, which I think most Pilates teachers do. Yeah. Yeah. So I love my oeuvre and 80% of my clients also love my oeuvre. 20% of my clients hate the oeuvre. So <laughs> I will give them foam roller exercises <laughs> instead. Thanks again for coming. Yeah. Um, that was a great conversation. So. And thank you so much for inviting me. I oh, was just so like, I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> so yeah, it's great yeah, to see so you. so great to talk to you. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I hope you enjoyed listening to this conversation as much as we did recording it. Louise is an inspiring teacher and you can hear why she's so respected in the Pilates community. If you want to learn more about Tor Pilates, including her YouTube channel, we'll leave some links in the show notes. Next episode, we have another great conversation, this time with someone who's both inspired and helped me personally, yoga teacher Mark Feely, so stay tuned for that one. Just before we leave you, I'd like to ask that you subscribe or rate us on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. It will really help us get the word out there so we can share this podcast with the world. Finally, we would really love to hear from you. You can drop a note on our website at podcast.flowartist.com or look for us on Facebook or Twitter. The theme song in this podcast is Baby Robots by Go Soul and used with permission. Do yourself a favor and get his music from ghostsoul.bandcamp.com. Thanks again. Big, big love. <laughs>